If you're just joining us, uh, we're taking this season of Lent, which is a 40-day period uh, that leads up to Easter, where historically Christians have, have set aside the distractions and refocused their hearts and their minds on Jesus. So that's what, that's what Lent is all about. It's this preparation time leading up to Easter as we celebrate the greatest event in all of human history, where, where God became flesh, lived a perfect sinless life, died on the cross, and then resurrected from the grave for, for our salvation. And so that's, that's three weeks from today. Just want to remind you of that. Want to remind you to be praying about and reaching out to who you're going to invite for Easter Sunday. Because people who don't go to church, go to church on Easter. Be thinking about that right now. Be praying about that person and be making those connections uh, so that you can invite them to come and see. And so that's, that's what we've been doing is just walking through the different invitations that Jesus extends in the Gospels to get a better understanding of just what he's inviting us into and, and also uh, so that we can refocus our lives on him and, and draw near to him. And so we, we have covered three of those invitations so far. Uh, the first one is that invitation to come and see, which is that no strings attached. No expectations. You just come and, and see who Jesus is with all your questions, with all your doubts, with all your insecurities, with all your fears, with all of your frustrations. You show up just as you are and you just explore who Jesus is with, with no commitment on your end. It is, a, it is an open-ended invitation for you to come and see who Jesus is. And that's the first invitation that Jesus gives is, hey, just, just however you are, whoever you are, come and see. And so that's why we say things like you can belong before you believe here. And that's why we expect that every single Sunday there are going to be people, whether they're in this room or tuning in online, who, who maybe they don't know what they believe about Jesus, but they're here. And so hear me, you're welcome here. We created this church for you. We started this church for you. And, and we don't have any expectations from you. We do have some expectations for you. We, we believe that God has some incredible things for you. And so we just want you to come and see. And then the second invitation, that Jesus extended was that invitation to come follow him. And this is the invitation he gave to his disciples. If you remember, we, we looked at every single passage in scripture that's recorded of Jesus actually inviting these, these individuals to come and be his disciples, to come follow him. And, and what we discovered in that process is that it is an invitation to, to leave something behind, to leave a, a certain life behind, and then also to go in a new direction. And so he calls that repentance. And, and what we also learned is that this is an invitation for sinners only. He said, I didn't I didn't come to call the righteous. So if you're righteous, you think you're righteous, you're self-righteous, this isn't really for you. The, the healthy don't need a doctor, the sick do. I came to call sinners to repentance, which is simply leaving that life behind and moving in a, in a new direction. And then last week, we talked about the invitation that we, we see from Jesus to come to him. All of us who are weary and heavy burdened, all of us who are, who are carrying extra loads and, and just are tired of, of striving to do this on our own. He says, no, no, come to me. Lay those burdens down at my feet. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And, and, and so it's just this invitation to come to Jesus, not just to follow him, but actually to come to him, to, to encounter him personally and to, to know him. And then also to lay our burdens down at his feet and then to carry his yoke, which is easy and his burdens are light. And so that's, that's what leads us to our fourth invitation today. Um, and this, this is a fun one for me. Uh, I believe it'll be a fun one for you too. The title of my message today uh, is Come On In, The Water's Fine. All right, so that's my translation of this invitation. If, you, if you're uh, a, maybe a Bible student or you spend a lot of time reading the Gospels, you probably know where I'm going with this invitation that Jesus gives to Peter. So this is the Chris Freeman translation, Come On In, The Water's Fine. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're going to pick it up in verse 22. Matthew chapter 14, and give you a little context as you're uh, getting there. Uh, what happens right before this passage that we're about to read is that Jesus performs this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. He takes the, the handful of loaves and fish, and then he multiplies them, turns it into this miraculous uh, um, meal for the multitudes, for 5,000 men, which means most likely somewhere between 20 and 30,000 people who were present, that, that he, uh, he also enables the disciples to participate in the distribution of that miracle, which is a pretty incredible thing. So that's that's what we're coming out of, and that's where we're going to pick up at verse, chap, uh, chapter 14, verse 22. Here we go. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, Buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. 
Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Verse 29, Jesus said, come on in, the water's fine. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So there are three components to this invitation that, that, that Jesus is extending, not just to Peter, but I believe this also applies to us in very practical ways. So I want to pull out these three components from this text for us today. They may sound a little obvious at face value, but, but we're going to dive deep into them. So the first one is this. This is an invitation. This invitation that Jesus extends, this is an invitation to get out of the boat. Again, maybe that's obvious. Maybe that seems clear, but but let's just unpack this a little bit. So first of all, you need to know this encounter is recorded in three of the four Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and John. So we just read Matthew's account, and it's actually in Matthew's account only that we we get uh, the, the description, the specific description of Peter walking on the water. The other two Gospels, they only record uh, Jesus walking on the water. But in Matthew's account, we also get the inclusion of Peter walking on the water as well. And then in Mark, uh, what we see in Mark in chapter 6, verse 48, same exact um, uh, s- scene here that's being described, same exact event, um, but, but in Mark's gospel it says, Jesus saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. So, so we hear in Matthew um, that, that they are a distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against them. In, in Mark... Uh, They're straining at the oars because the wind was against them. And then in John chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, it tells us that it was dark out and a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. So they are in a very difficult scenario right here. Very difficult situation. And, And what you need to know about these disciples is that they were not rookies to the water. They were not newbies out there. This was not a an uncharted territory for them. They had spent a lot of time on this same body of water. This is the, the Lake of Genseray that we talked about a couple weeks ago, also known as the Sea of Galilee. This is a body of water that they spent a significant amount of time on. Uh, a handful of these guys were uh, well-trained fishermen who had spent their whole life out on this water, fishing in these waters, rowing across these waters. And so they would have known this lake very well. They would have known how to navigate the lake. They would have known every strategy known to man at that time and available to them and their resources to get across this lake. This would not have been their first storm yet. All three of these gospels tell us that they were getting nowhere. They were striving, they were straining, and they were getting nowhere. So then Jesus comes walking toward them, even though they're, they're striving, straining, it's dark out, they're doing everything they can. Jesus comes walking toward them and they lose their minds. The situation goes from bad to worse. They think there's now this this ghost that's coming out to attack them in some form or fashion. And Jesus reassures them in that moment. He says, no, 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 don't don't worry. He he says, immediately, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. It's me. It's me. I I, I know this, this doesn't make sense. I know this doesn't compute. I know this doesn't add up in your head. I know you're still in this journey, in this process of figuring out who I really am. I know you've seen me do some things before. I, I, I get it. This one's a new one. But it's me, you can trust me. And then Jesus and Peter have this incredible back and forth where Jesus invites Peter to get out of the boat. And I I don't know about you, but every time I read this passage, every time I preach on this passage, I always come back to asking the same questions. Like I, I always find myself wondering what in the world is going through Peter's mind in this dialogue between him and Jesus? Because they they think it's a ghost. Jesus says, No, no, don't don't worry. Take take courage, it's me, it's I. Don't be afraid. And then Peter's immediate response is, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out of the boat and walk to you on the water. And I'm not sure if Peter just didn't think this one through, but like, what if it's not Jesus? (laughs) Have you ever thought about that before? Like, what if it wasn't Jesus and he still says, come? Like, that's a bad situation. And so he doesn't have like another strategy here. He's not like, hey, show me. remember that one thing? Remember we got that secret code word? If it's you, prove it. No, it's just, if it's you, tell me to get out of the boat and come to you on the water. And I don't know, I know Peter is also uh, very well known for for kind of being one of those guys who acts first and thinks later. And that's what I love about Peter. There's a little bit of Chris Freeman in Peter, right? There's a little bit of Peter in Chris Freeman. I love that about him. 
And so, so maybe that's part of it. But I honestly think the more I study this passage, the, the more I come to the conclusion that Peter was just out of options. He was out of options. So he didn't have a good, good solution. And so he realizes, like, man, like, we've been working as hard as we can. We've been striving and straining. We've been working at this thing for hours. And we're getting nowhere. And so, so I, if I stay in the boat, it's a loss. And so I, I, I see, I, I think it's Jesus. It sounds like Jesus. He's coming toward me. He's doing things I've never seen before. And I'm still learning to trust, like, yeah, he can walk on water. Can I walk on water? I'm not really sure. But, Lord, if it's you, I, I'm just asking, tell me to come. Tell me to come because I'm, I'm out of options. I don't have any other solutions. And so then Peter gets this invitation from Jesus to, to move in a different direction, to try something different, try something that he's never done before. And it's an invitation to get out of the boat. Now, again, on, on paper, it doesn't make sense. Like, I, I get it. You're in a boat and, and you're in a storm. You're going nowhere. And so that's not a really great situation. Getting out of the boat doesn't seem like the, the right practical next step. But Jesus extends that invitation to him. He says, yeah, P Peter, come on out. Come. Just one more. Just, just come. And I, I want to encourage you that I, I believe this same invitation exists for us today. I believe that Jesus is saying to each and every one of us in, in the situations we find ourselves in, in the storms of our life, in, in the difficult kind of passages that we're, we're trying to navigate through where, where no matter what we do, we keep running up against a wall and we can't make progress. Jesus is saying, look, there's a different way and there's a better way. And so I'm going to invite you like, yes, you, listen, I recognize you've been given it your all. I recognize that you have given your very best efforts and you have done everything you know how to do and you're still getting nowhere. I'm going to invite you to try something different. I'm going to invite you to get out of the boat. And as I was praying about this passage this week, I was, I was just really pressing in and asking the Holy Spirit, like, yeah, but how does this, like, practically, how does this apply to us? Like, Jesus, I don't think you're asking us all to literally go get out on a boat in, in the middle of some lake around here and then, and then try this later this week. And so just hear me. That's my official disclaimer, all right? Like, just not telling you to actually go try this literally this week. But as I was pressing in and praying about this, I really felt like the Holy Spirit kept reminding me that this boat in, in, in our lives in many ways, it represents a certain level of security, represents a certain level of stability, and it represents a certain level of just, just um, the known. Like the, the world that we know, the world that we're comfortable with, the world that we've been navigating through. Like, like, like even though it may, it may not be all that great, even though we may be war working through some really difficult situations and we're getting nowhere, we keep using the same strategies, we keep trying the same approaches, even though we know it's not going to lead anywhere, but it's, it feels safer. And, and, it, and, it, and it also gives us this element of like, yeah, there's a little bit of control there. Like I, when, when I'm in the boat, I've got the oars. And if I keep trying, if I try harder and harder, I've got a little bit of control over how this thing goes. And so it represents this, this kind of element of, of safety, this element of control, this element of security, it's, it's this known entity, and the reality is outside of the boat is the unknown. It's uncharted territory. It's, it's, it's a place that we've never been. It's a direction we've never gone. It's a trust that we've never stepped into. And Jesus is inviting us to step out of that certain level of control and security and comfort and step out into the unknown and to really trust him and, and to listen to him and to go where he calls us to go. And I, I just think, how many of us, how many of us have been sitting in that same spot, have been stuck in those same patterns, running into those same problems, and we've been striving, and we've been straining, and we're getting nowhere, and, and we know there's, a, there's another option, but it just doesn't feel all that safe. And so we would prefer to stay put in this place where there's not a whole lot of freedom, but there's a, there's a certain sense of safety here. Out there, maybe there's some freedom, but, but man, there is a huge risk associated with that. And the invitation from Jesus is, is to let that go. Remember, remember a couple weeks ago, the the call to be a disciple is to leave something behind. And so Jesus is saying to Peter, yeah, like, you, there's, there's something for you. I've got something for you, but, but in order for you to experience that, you've got to get out of the boat first. Like, you, you can't walk on the water and sit in the boat at the same time. You, you've got to make a decision. Like, it's, a, it's a either you're with me or, or you're going to stay put. But if you want to experience what I have for you, you've got to get out of the boat. 
And what I also love about this invitation from Jesus, because it's not just about, about connecting us to following him, it's also a, an invitation to come to him, connecting us to last week's invitation. For those of us who've been carrying these heavy loads, it's an invitation to surrender. He said, you've been striving. You've been working as hard as you can. You've been giving your very best effort. You've used all of the resources you know how to use. And you're getting nowhere. I'm, I'm inviting you to let that go. I'm inviting you to drop the oars, Peter. To let it go. To climb out of the boat. And to try something different. It's going to require total surrender. It's going to require complete trust. But what I love about this invitation, and, and as I've been praying about this all week, the Holy Spirit has just kept bringing me back to this, this phrase that this invitation is an invitation to a new path that requires little effort, but large faith. It requires little effort. So prior to this, there was a whole lot of effort. There was a whole lot of striving, a whole lot of straining. And, and, and what Jesus is saying is, that's great. You gave it your very best. You're getting nowhere. What I'm asking you to do is actually surrender that, give up control, let go of it, and, and stop striving, just, just give that up and instead step into something that it's not going to require a whole lot of effort from you. You're not going to be pulling the boat anymore. Like, like this, is, this actually is probably going to feel like the easiest thing you've ever done, but it's going to require some large faith from you. Before, you had a whole lot of effort and very little faith. Now I'm inviting you into something that requires little effort but a whole lot of faith. And that's the invitation that Jesus gives us to get out of the boat, to get out of the boat. And I, as I was praying about this, this passage this week and just reflecting on my own personal life, uh, many of you have heard this story before, but I, but I also recognize that, you know, people are coming in, into this church all along the way. And so I was just thinking about how uh, about six years ago at, at this moment, in this, this period of time, my wife and I were still living over in Dayton, Ohio, and I was on staff at a large church over there, and, and uh, my wife had a, a great teaching job, and we were kind of building our life and our, our family, and we had, you know, great plans for our future. And then God put this, this call on our life to leave and to go plant a church. And, and I remembered that same feeling of, like, man, this, this feels crazy. Like, on paper, this doesn't make sense. Like, this just doesn't add up. And the more I, I researched and the more I learned about church planting, the more I, I learned, like, this is just a really bad idea. <laughs> like, like, this is just, I remember going to one of the church planting conferences and, and they said, 93% um, uh, of all church plants fail. 7% success rate. How many of you, when you were like trying to pick your career path, you were like, well, yeah, I want one with a 7% success rate. Let's do that. And then I, I remembered this, this feeling of like, man, like, like we're going to quit jobs. I've got to raise money. And right around that same time, we got pregnant with our son. And, and that wasn't on purpose. Like, we knew what we were doing, but it wasn't intentional, if you know what I mean. Like, <laughs> we weren't trying to get pregnant. And so we got pregnant with him. And then my wife, so then we knew, like, it was early in the spring, we got pregnant. And so we knew by the time we had moved, relocated to Fort Wayne in the fall, she, you know, if she wanted to find a teaching job, we knew that, that just wasn't going to be possible. Um, she, she's going to have a baby that year. And so just all these, all these factors that kept making this more and more difficult. And so we, we set this goal to, to raise some money. And, and I remember we, we came up with this dollar amount that felt impossible to me. We said, man, we, we need to raise enough money so that we can sell our house and, and move and pay for our moving expenses and relocation and buy a new house and, and then also uh, so that we can provide for our family that year and then also we had to buy our own health insurance for that year. And so we set this, this goal. We said we want to raise $60,000 for, for this year to take care of our family's needs. And I remember praying about that and just feeling this is, like I had never raised more than like $60 in my life at that point, like $60,000. But after some, some conversations with the people, they said, yeah, that, that sounds about right. Like, that's what you're going to need. It's going to take every bit of that. And I remember us just taking that before God and saying, all right, God, like, we're, we're going to step out of the boat. We're going to do this. We're going to go into some, some places and, and some directions that I've never gone before. We're going to try some things. We're just going to trust you with this. And that year, God provided us with a total amount of $90,000 
So we had $30,000 we were able to gift to the launch of this church so that there was a cash reserve from, from day one. And, and City Church uh, started debt-free, had, had no debt, no strain, no financial challenge whatsoever, and, and God just provided, but we had to step out in faith. And then as I was thinking about that this week, it was, it was pretty incredible, the timing of this passage. And many of you know we, we bought this grocery store, the old Scott's grocery store with the giant cornucopia on the top. Um, very, very well-known kind of iconic building in the southeast side of Fort Wayne. And uh, our, our plans are to renovate that building and relocate in there and, and make that our permanent church home as well as use that as a blessing and, and a gift to the city to just u- utilize it to serve our community as, as well as we possibly can. And so we had some meetings over there. We're, we've narrowed it down now. We have our building and our architect locked in. And, and so things are starting to get real, starting to get real. And we're walking through this space, and, uh, and I was thinking about just how six years ago, what felt impossible, $60,000. And now we're walking through this building, and God reminded me, this is 60,000 square feet. 60,000 square feet. And every single one of those feel a little bit impossible to me. And, uh, and, and construction costs right now are somewhere between, uh, for re- renovation, somewhere between $125 and $175 a square foot. So you do the math on that if you want to. That all feels impossible to me. And then as I'm, I'm preparing to preach this message, God just kept reminding me, you got to step out of the boat. You got to step out of the boat. And so can I just tell you, church, like there's going to come a day, and it's coming soon, where we collectively are going to have to step out of the boat. Amen. Yeah. And, and we're going to see God work in some incredible ways as, as we work to, to raise funds and, and renovate and do what he is calling us to do. Yeah. But we're going to have to step out of the boat together. And so it was just such a powerful reminder, the timing of all that, that about six years ago at this moment, uh, we found out my wife was pregnant, we were going to move, and all these things, and then here we are six years later, and we've got 60,000 square feet to figure out how to, how to turn into this, this, uh, this future home for City Church. God is inviting us out of the boat. Point number two is this. This is an invitation to walk on water. Amen. So, so I, I know, again, like, obvious, right? Seems obvious. It's an invitation to get out of the boat. Yeah, obviously, that's what he did. It's an invitation to walk on water. Yeah, obviously. But but can we just slow down for a second and just think about that? Can we just sit with that for a minute? Like, I I just want to read this to you again. Verse 29, after Peter said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come on the water. Verse 29, come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat. Just, Just listen to this. Got down out of the boat, walked on the water walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Now, how many times when you're reading this passage, do you just kind of want to blow right through that, just like I do, I'm always tempted to, and jump over to verse 30 where where it says, "When, when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus caught him and said, you have little faith, why did you doubt? And how many sermons on this passage have you heard that spend the whole time focusing on the fact that if Peter would have, you know, fixed his eyes on Jesus, not gotten distracted by all of these other things, the wind and the waves, that then he wouldn't have started to sink. And we miss out on the fact that Peter walked on water. He's the only one outside of Jesus himself in all of human history to actually walk on water. So, so can I just caution you not, not to get fixated on, on the failure here? That we'll get there in a second. But can you, just, can you just sit with this for a second? That he got to walk on water. The invitation from Jesus was to walk on water and he actually got to do it. He got to experience that. Listen to me. The invitation from Jesus. Yes, it's an invitation to leave something behind, to get out of the boat. But it's also an invitation to head in a new direction and experience something new. Jesus' invitation for your life is not to live a boring, simple, safe life. That's not what he's inviting you into. And so I want to caution us not to water down Christianity, to make it about just just going through the motions, make sure you read your Bible every day, get your few chapters in, show up to church on a Sunday morning, sing a few songs, jump in a small group, and then just go on about your life. And when you walk through the coffee shop, you know, you say, the Lord bless you as you pick up your cup. All those things are great. All those things are fine. He has so much more for you. So much more for you. 
He's inviting you into this adventurous, incredible life where you get to experience things that nobody else gets to experience, where you get to experience things that you will not ever be able to experience on your own. You can either sit in the boat and row away and get nowhere, or you can get out of the boat and walk on water. That's the invitation from Jesus. He's inviting us to walk on the water. And listen, I, I believe that Jesus still does the miraculous today. I've seen it. I've experienced it. And when Jesus calls us, listen, he's not going to invite you into something that he's not going to provide a way for you to walk through. And so it doesn't make sense. But this is why the scriptures tell us that we walk by faith and not by sight. What happened when Peter started to sink? What was it? It was when he what? When he saw the wind. I don't even know what that means. Like, how do you see wind? I don't even know what that means. But the scripture says he saw the wind. I'm assuming it means he saw the effects of the wind, the waves and everything else that was coming at him. And so he stopped walking by faith at that moment and started walking by sight. But listen, God wants you to experience the miraculous. He has incredible things for your life. He, he doesn't want you to just live this boring, safe life. Just simple life. He, he, he has so much more for you. Now, let, let me talk for a second about, about Peter's failure. This is important. When you step out in faith and you do things you've never done before, hear me, failure is a part of the process. It's a part of the process. Who didn't fail in this scenario? The Christian answer is Jesus, right? That's the churchy answer. But, but let's, let's think a little broader here. Who, who didn't fail? People in the, boat. the people in the boat. They didn't fail. They didn't sink. They didn't fail. And they also didn't walk on water. So, so, hear me. I would much, much rather this be the kind of church where we are constantly, continually stepping out in faith, stepping into the unknown, and, and failing along the way, then sitting back in safety and security and saying, you know what, like, I'm, I'm good. Like, I can't remember the last time I failed God. If that's your statement, I can't remember the last time I failed God, I would challenge you to ask, when's the last time you stepped out in faith for God? Yeah. Failure is a part of the process. It's a natural part of the process. And hear me, you're going to fail either way. You're going to fail either way. I would much rather fail in faith than fail out of fear. So you're, you're going to fail. And when you fail in faith, you know where, the, the way you fail? You fail toward Jesus. Amen. Peter failed, but guess what? He was the closest one to Jesus. So he was able in that moment to cry out and say, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out, grabbed him, saved him. And then his only question for him is, why did you doubt? He didn't say, why did you fail? He just, why did you doubt, Peter? Which I think is a really hilarious question after all. Like Peter's like, are you, are you, are you kidding? <laughs> I just wonder what the rest of that conversation looked like. Why did you doubt? Like, come on, man, you were doing so great. Jesus isn't condemning him. He's saying, you, you were doing it. Nobody else even got to, got to experience this. You, were doing, you got out of the boat. So you got to walk on water. Listen, if you want to walk on water, you better expect some failure along the way. And you better allow some grace for yourself. And also, you better allow some grace for your brothers and sisters as they step out of the boat and they start walking on water. And so that's, that's just the kind of culture, that's the kind of environment that we want to have around this place is there's permission to fail. There is permission to fail. Fail forward, fail toward Jesus, fail out of a place of faith. And then number three. And this, this one's the most important. And the other two really don't matter at all without this one. So this, this is really important. I want to encourage you again, write these down. This is an invitation to come to Jesus. This is an invitation to come to Jesus. So listen, this isn't just about stepping out of the boat. And this isn't just about walking on water. It's ultimately about an invitation to come toward Jesus. So much so that, that watch this, if Jesus isn't there and if Jesus isn't, isn't the one doing the inviting, then getting out of the boat is actually a really dumb decision. And walking on the water isn't even a possibility. So, so, so don't mistake this message to be a message where I'm, I'm just telling you, you know, you got to take some risks. You got you to let go of control and, and you, you know, you got to go experience these incredible things. You got to go live a life of adventure. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is you've got to come toward Jesus. 
And when Jesus invites you to come toward him, you do whatever it takes, including taking risks and letting go of control and stepping out of the boat and experiencing the miraculous. This is an invitation to Jesus. We want to fix our eyes on Jesus. We want to come toward Jesus. Jesus says to Peter, come to me. So I want to go back. I want to go back to the interaction between Peter and Jesus um, because I do think with a little more context, this, this dialogue makes a little more sense. So again, one more time in Matthew 14, verses 27 through 29. But immediately Jesus said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. So the disciples hear Jesus. They hear his voice. He's still clearly far enough away that they can't quite make it out. But it sounds like Jesus. It seems like it's Jesus. He's saying the kinds of things that Jesus says, and he's their rabbi, and so, so they, they just do whatever he does. If he, if he says, follow me, they go where he goes, so much so that they would just, whatever, wherever he walked, they walked, including on the water. And so, so he says, take courage as I don't be afraid. And so Peter then says, verse 28, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. He walked toward Jesus. So last week, in this invitation that Jesus gives us to come to him, all who are weary, it's an invitation to come to him, to know him personally, intimately, to come to him. We also talked in John chapter 10 about how Jesus referred to himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And and he says that the sheep follow the shepherd because they know his voice. The sheep follow the shepherd. Wherever the shepherd goes, wherever he walks, they walk. Whatever he does, they do because they know his voice. So so then I want to connect you to two weeks ago when we talked about Jesus' invitation to his disciples to come follow him. And in Luke 5, we unpacked this more um, specifically, the invitation that he gave to Peter. And we we read that invitation where Jesus tells him to come be his disciple, that in Luke 5, verse 4, he said, uh, text says, uh, he said to Simon Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for the catch. Put out into deep water and let down the nets for the catch. And I, I don't know if you have connected these dots yet or not, or you realize this or not, but this is that same body of water. This is the Sea of Galilee, the same, the same body of water where Jesus called Peter for the very first time, where he told him, put out into deep water and let down the nets for the catch. And then Peter has the greatest catch of his life, so much so that they filled two boats full where they were starting to sink. And then it was in that moment that Jesus says these words to Peter, come, follow me. And I'll make you fishers of men. And so here we are, later on, same body of water. And this this is just my speculation. Scripture doesn't tell us, but this is just my speculation. But I can't help but wonder if their boat wasn't maybe in that exact same spot, out in that deep water. And and so Peter's reminiscing and remembering the, the encounter that he had with Jesus, where Jesus said, come follow me. And he, he's recalling the fact that, yeah, Jesus has performed miracles. I remember I was sitting right here. I was maybe sitting in the very same boat even. And, and I remember Jesus performing this miracle. I remember him doing things that nobody else can do. I remember watching these boats fill up so full that, it, I mean, I spent the whole night out on the water, didn't catch a single thing. I fished these waters all the time. I know what was out there. And then Jesus shows up and I have this miracle of this most incredible catch of fish in my life. And then I wonder if he was thinking, you know what? And then, and then we were just, just on the other side of this lake and, and I watched Jesus take a handful of loaves and fish and turn it into a meal for thousands and thousands and thousands of people. He's, he's doing things I've never seen done before. And Jesus says that the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And so Peter calls out to him. And, and, and I, I think the reason why Peter phrased the question the way he did is because he needed to hear that exact same word again. He said, Jesus, if it's you, if, it, if it's really you, tell me to come to you out on the water. Because that's what a rabbi does. He says, come follow me. Wherever that he goes, I go. So if it's really you, tell me. And he heard Jesus say one word, come. 
come. And that's all he needed. Because the, the sheep know the sound of the voice of their shepherd. And they, they go to where he calls them to go. And so that's, that's all it took for Peter. And that, that brother was climbing down out of that water. He started walking out of that water. Can you imagine like what was going through his mind in this moment? He's, he's thinking either this really is a ghost and I've already been killed. Like I'm just having some sort of weird afterlife experience right now. Or <laughs> there was something in them loaves and fish that we ate right before we got in this boat. But this, I am tripping out of my mind. Or I'm, I'm walking on water right now. And I'm walking toward my Messiah, my Savior, Jesus. And yet, yeah, did, did Peter fail? Yep, sure he did. Did Jesus rescue him in that moment? Absolutely he did because he's faithful. And then they climbed back in the boat and the response was for everybody in the boat, that includes Peter now, every single person in the boat to say, truly you are the son of God and they worshiped him. Watch this, Peter's faith Peter's faith and then Peter's obedience actually led people who, who maybe didn't, weren't quite there yet, didn't have enough faith to fall down on their knees and worship Jesus too. You, you never know who might be watching you. You never know who might need to see your faith in action for them to come to saving faith in Jesus and worship him. Jesus is inviting you to come to him. To come to him. No matter where you are in life right now, no matter what you're dealing with in life, no matter what storms you're facing, no matter what challenges you're experiencing, Jesus is inviting you to come to him, just as you are to come to him. He's inviting you, and I'm, I'm telling you, if you'll trust him, listen, the safest place you can ever be in this life is wherever Jesus is. It's not the boat. Listen, that, that's an illusion of control. That, that's an illusion of security. But you're not going to get anywhere if you stay in that boat. The safest possible place for you is wherever Jesus is. So as Jesus invites you to come, just, just go. Step out of the boat. Experience the miraculous. Walk on water. Experience the, the transforming power of Jesus in your life. Experience the transforming work of the Holy Spirit in and through your heart and your life, and you will get to taste and see that the Lord is good. You will get to experience things that nobody else on planet Earth will ever get to experience. You'll get a walk on water. But it's because you're, you're, you're moving toward Jesus. So I want to wrap this up just with maybe connecting this to the bigger picture, which is the gospel message, and I love how this passage reminds us of the gospel message. So, so the passage begins with the disciples doing everything they can in their own power, but they're helpless and stranded. Has anybody else been at that place before where you just feel helpless and stranded? I know I have. Like you've done it all, you've tried it all, and, and just no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're trying, you're getting nowhere. That's them. Helpless and stranded. And then what happens next? Jesus, watch this, this is so important, this is theologically important. Jesus comes to them. They don't go to Jesus. They don't even cry out to Jesus. They keep striving and straining on their own. Jesus comes to them. And is that not the gospel message that while we were yet sinners, when we could not get to God, God said, you know what? I'm going to come to you. I'm going to send my son Jesus to you to come and live amongst you, with you, to die on the cross for you, to pay a price that you could not pay. I'm going to come to you. Jesus came to us when we could not get to him. He comes to the disciples. And then he reassures them, it's me, don't be afraid. It's me, you can trust me. And he is reassuring you of the same thing. Yes, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. The kingdom of heaven is kind of this upside down thing that you're just gonna have to step out in faith and trust and believe, but he's going to reassure you along the way. You will hear his voice. You will hear his voice. But then watch this, there's still this element. He comes to us. But there's, this, there's still this element of faith that is required. He says, I'm right here. I'm right here. I came to you. I, I, you couldn't get to me, so I came to you. But I'm telling you, you, you can either stay in the boat or you can come to me. But, but it's going to require some faith from you. You're going you're to have to trust and you're going to have to believe. And that is the element of faith that God asks from all of us. First, he gives that to us. He gives us that gift of faith. And then he asks us to act on it to trust him and to step out in faith. And then because of that, we get to do the impossible. 
we get to experience the impossible and the incredible. And yes, do we fail along the way? Do we get distracted along the way? Do we make mistakes along the way? And do we sin along the way? Absolutely we do. Because we're not Jesus, he is. But when we fail, you know what we do? We cry out and we say, Lord, save me. And he's there every single time to pick us up, to rescue us. He will not leave you alone. He will not abandon you. He will always be there with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He has given you the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you and to save you and redeem you and rescue you. And then as a result of that salvation, they climb back in the boat and what does everybody do? They fall down and worship. And is that not the culmination of our faith? Is that not the culmination of the gospel? Is that every single one of us just get to come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the resurrected King, and just worship him for who he is and for what he has done in our lives? This is the hope of the gospel. This is the good news of the gospel. Jesus is inviting you to come. He's inviting you to come. Let me pray for you. I'm going to invite our prayer team forward at this time as well. Heavenly Father, we come before you just grateful. Grateful for the truth of your gospel that is saturated throughout your word. We thank you that you sent Jesus to us when we could not get to him. Jesus, we thank you that, that you will do whatever it takes to save us, to come to us and to save us. When, when we have been striving and working and straining with no success, getting nowhere, you came and offered us a different way and a better way. And so we just thank you for that. We thank you that you have invited us to get out of the boat, to walk on water, and to come to you. And Lord, I pray that would be true for every single one of us, that we wouldn't live out of a place of fear, that we wouldn't live out of this place of, of insecurity or doubt, but that we would step out, afraid, uh, out in faith and not be afraid to fail. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would empower us we can't do this on our own, but we know that you are with us, that you dwell within us. So I just ask you to fill us and lead us and guide us to follow you. Lord, we, we sang, Holy Spirit, we, have, we sang today, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. I can walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And so Holy Spirit, I pray that that would not just be a song that we sing, but those would be true words about our life. And I pray that the result would be that we get to experience the incredible, the miraculous, and that it leads not just us, but those around us as well to worship you, Jesus, for who you are. We love you. We trust you. We choose to come to you. We pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen.